Welcome to the worship service of Fairview Presbyterian Church on this Reign of Christ Sunday. This is the last Sunday in our Christian calendar year. Next year begins the start of a new one with the first Sunday in Advent. We have just a few announcements this morning. The nominating committee is beginning the work of finding members for the pastor nominating committee. Please make sure to read in the weekly blast what it means to be on the search the, the search committee for your new pastor. Pray over it, and if you feel led by the Spirit, please let Pat Gutendorf know you would like to be considered. Or if you read the description and it brings to mind someone you think would be just the person, please pass that name along. The nominating committee will meet and discern and pray over the names that have been submitted to us. If you would like to help decorate for Advent in the week ahead, please let Janet Russell know you are interested and she will help arrange a time for you to be involved. Um, Lynn Curry asked me to announce that today is the day for Thanksgiving turkey items um, to be turned in and also um, the shoe boxes. If you have those completed, if you are not at the uh, in-person service today, we ask that you somehow arrange to get those items back today. And also we have Run for Shelter t-shirts for sale for $20 and that money of course goes to, um, goes to the Run for Shelter event and will help uh, help with homelessness in Gwinnett County. The reopening committee met again. It is always our intent to keep everyone who comes to Fairview as safe as possible. We would like to remind small group gatherings that the same safety procedures apply as the ones for worship. Also, we set a metric of 15% positivity rate in Gwinnett County as the point when we will return to virtual worship only. Our prayer is that we never get to that number of positive cases, but trust that this committee is closely watching the numbers coming out of the Department of Public Health and doing so with the goal of keeping everyone here safe and healthy in this uncertain time. One last note before we worship, we will have communion later in the service, so please prepare your elements at home for that. And now let us turn our hearts and minds to worship with the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God, a great ruler over heaven and earth. With sincere and repentant hearts, let us name our sins against Christ and one another. Lord Jesus, judge of the nations, we confess that we have not seen your face among our neighbors in need. We have not shared our food with the hungry. We have not offered clothes to the destitute or shelter to the homeless. We have not welcomed the stranger, nor have we visited prisoners. We have not paid attention to these, your sisters and brothers. And in our neglect, we have failed to serve you. Lord, forgive us. Open our eyes to recognize your beloved family and give us the blessing of sincere repentance that we may know the joy of eternal life with you and all the saints in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Friends, God seeks the lost sheep and feeds them with justice. Forgiven and freed, turn then and live in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you raised Christ from the dead and established him as Lord over every rebellious power. Give us grace to serve him wisely and faithfully that the world may see his glorious inheritance among the saints and recognize the freedom of joyful obedience in Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, open the eyes of our hearts by the power of your Spirit, that we may know the hope to which we have been called in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey kids, I want to talk about another scripture verse that is a favorite of someone in our community. This is Mrs. Mary Bettinger's, and it comes from the Old Testament in our Bible. I really like this one too. I want you to listen to it and see the picture, and then I'll talk to you about it. It's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This one verse says so much about how God takes care of those who are tired, who have been dealing with hard things like bad treatment from others or illness or even hard work that just doesn't end. We can remember this verse when it seems like life is hard and we can remember that God not only doesn't leave us, but rather gives us the energy to keep going. And not just keep going, but going like we see in the grace and strength of an eagle flying in, in the wind or a runner who can keep on running without growing tired or even walking and not losing any energy. 
We can count on God to be right there with us. So the next time you feel like something is getting you down, remember this verse and ask God to help you be strong. Let's pray together. Dear God, we want our lives to be easy. We want these kids to grow and be comfortable and have fun, but we know life brings us troubles. We also know you are here with them through those. Please help them through the hard times as you have done for your people throughout the ages. In your son's name we pray, amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm chapter 95, verses one through seven A. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Our New Testament reading comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is, form every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What both of these passages for the day have in common is they each tell of wonderful things God has done and who we are in God's world. The great things God has, hath done in the psalm center around creation, while in our epistle passage, God's saving work through Jesus Christ is the focus of God's doing. Also, the who we are in these scriptures differ. In the psalm, we are sheep, intoning that we are the people God takes care of by shepherding us. Because of this, we are called to worship God. We, as people of God, should have an active response to God's work for us. In Ephesians, though, while we hear of God's promises, we hear God promises us this rich inheritance through Jesus Christ, we are also called to be active participants because of that inheritance. We are called to be the church. Now you may be thinking, yes, the church, and we worship in church. But these words, I believe, call for much more than worship, just like our Amos text did last week. Let's talk for a moment about the letter to the Ephesians. It is thought to be perhaps a letter to churches in general because of the lack of specific occasion or reason for writing we often find in Paul's letters. The recipients of the letter are referred to as Gentiles, but they are told to no longer live as the Gentiles live. This letter calls the people of the church to respond to the good news of the gospel by radical transformation in their personal and social identities. They are to reform their lives to God's purposes and into God's family. The first verse of our passage today that, that reads, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints is full of communal language using plural pronouns and the word all. It is very inclusive language indeed. The letter is full of instruction to guide them in the world and before God. Scholars date this letter around the last third of the first century. Let's leave the first century and fast forward to the 1970s, the decade I was born. I have few memories of world affairs from that time. I was, after all, still a small child when the next decade rolled in, and my world was small and me-centered, as is normal for a child even up into and through the teenage years. 
But during the decade that came to be known as the Me Decade, coined in a famous article by Tom Wolfe published in the New York Magazine in 1976, people began to speak of a personal relationship with God, or Jesus. Jesus began to be referred to as my personal savior, and the usage of those terms skyrocket, skyrocketed in the decade since. The quote by Tom Wolfe in his article that denotes the 70s as such reads, we are now in the me decade, seeing the upward roll and not yet the crest by any means of the third great religious wave in American history one that historians will very likely term the Third Great Awakening. Whatever the Third Great Awakening amounts to, for better or for worse, will have to do with this unprecedented post-World War II American development, the luxury enjoyed by so many millions of middling folk of dwelling upon the self. Another author, Joel J. Miller, a theologian, comments on Wolf's work saying, we can claim to be set apart and that our faith keeps us grounded, but what if our personal relationship with Jesus is just flailing in our self-centered cultural currents while we're unaware of the pull? I didn't just happen on these authors' works. For years now, I've been thinking about why the stringing together of the words personal relationship with Jesus has given me pause. And I found these writings that helped me discover the dating of it. But before I found them online, I was gifted the scriptures provided by the lectionary today. Our psalm speaks of our Creator God, the one who tends us like sheep. And we know from the shepherd sheep metaphor that a shepherd knows his sheep very well. We know from our creation story that God created us in God's own image. The prophet Jeremiah's call story includes this telling of God's words. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. In Ephesians, and in so many other places in the New Testament, we are told that Jesus' blood has saved us. Before today's passage, Ephesians 1.5 reports that God destined us for adoption as His children through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of His good will. I give you all these bi biblical references to make the point that God, God has already done the hard work of forging a personal relationship with us. That is not to say that we should take our relationship for granted. But I believe the point of the Ephesians passage is to say that our relationship with Jesus is lived out primarily through the church, the church which is His body. On this Christ the King or Reign of Christ Sunday, whichever you prefer to call it, we must recognize that the Lordship of Jesus Christ ushers in a new age, one of communal witness, not solitary reward. This Sunday, the last one in our Christian calendar year, is set aside as a time to celebrate the work of God that is already accomplished in the saving death of Jesus Christ. At the same time, we anticipate the day when this idea of the reign of Christ will be accomplished in every human heart. It is a day we recognize the already not yet tension we feel. We cannot accomplish the now, the all, all the way there reign of Christ in every heart if we try to get there only personally. I once heard an interview with Mary, Cath Mary Catherine Bateson. I don't know if you've heard of her or not. I had not before this interview, but the title of the interview was called Composing a Life. And that was so compelling to me. So I tuned in. I learned that Bateson is the daughter of Margaret Mead, who I have at least heard of, although I don't know a great deal about her. Mead was a renowned anthropologist who gets quoted quite often. Bateson quoted Mead in this interview, noting that this has been said so often it is now a slogan. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. She used this as an example to explain what her mother meant when she used the term evolutionary clusters. Bateson went on to, Bateson went on to further explain, stating, very often major accelerations of change came out when a group of people got together and learned together and dared to think new thoughts and then pass them on. And that's true of the disciples of Jesus, a small group that pow, spread out, spreading ideas that they'd learned. It was true of the American Revolution, a group of thoughtful colonists thinking actually about French philosophy mainly and deciding they wanted to be independent. And the point is that the evolutionary part of that was in the relationships between the members of those small groups, feeding off of each other's imaginations and insights and wisdom and then spreading them out in the society going forward. 
Now, Jesus inspired 12 people to follow him. They in turn inspired so many more that the church was formed to make these small groups, these evolutionary clusters. And we know from the gospel stories that Jesus expected the disciples to affect change. He empowered them to. And we can read in our Ephesians passage, verse 18, the prayer that the readers of the letter may know the hope to which God has called them. Indeed, in this passage, we can choose to believe that this hope is a call to accept the gift of participation in God's saving work. Not complacency, not personal satisfaction, nor smug disdain for others who do not know Christ. But our call, should we accept it, is to fulfill a role in Christ's ongoing work of salvation and reconciliation as we continue to break down dividing walls among us. I want to return to Wolf's article because in it he reflects back to a time when people did not, as they do now, live their life thinking, I only have one life to live. This was in the 1970s, admittedly, but to me seems a fairly rampant attitude now also. Wolf eloquently states, the husband and wife who sacrifice their own ambitions and their material assets in order to provide a better future for their children. The soldier who risks his life or perhaps consciously sacrifices it in battle. The man who devotes his life to some struggle for his people that cannot possibly be won in his lifetime. People, or most of them, who buy life insurance or leave wills, and for that matter, most women upon becoming pregnant for the first time, are people who conceive of themselves, however unconsciously, as part of a great biological stream. Just as something of their ancestors lives on in them, so will something of them live on in their children, or in their people, their race, their community. For childless people, too, conduct their lives and try to arrange their post-mortem affairs with concern for how the great stream is going to flow on. While Wolf does not speak in biblical terms here, I cannot help grasping onto the language of community, even communing with ancestors, which reminded me of our communion with the saints. The imagery of us all being part of a biological stream gripped me as something to hold on to and share with you all. It sounds very scientific, as do the words evolutionary clusters, but I have a third set of words to throw at you that sounds far less technical. Divine empathy. Presbyterian pastor and theologian Edward Farley once wrote of the empathetic union between father and son at Calvary on the cross. The words we read today to the Ephesians seem to suggest a similar divine empathy. It, it seems to suggest that that empathy extends to the church as the body of Christ. We should all be swept up into an evolutionary cluster, a church that has hopefully formed along a biological stream of desire to participate in this divine empathy. We are promised riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. Is this the crux? I ask you that those of us who believe are charged to use our belief as power to do the work of Christ and the saints. I believe it is, and I believe the goal of our work here on earth as the church, the body of Christ, is to make this age look like what we want, the, what we want the age to come to look like, what we expect it to look like. Being complacent, resting on our laurels, being confident in our place in the age to come is not doing the work of Christ who worked and wanted the kingdom of God to be here and now when he walked among us. Fairview Presbyterian Church was once a small cluster that grew to a much larger one and has since evolved back to a smaller one. Divisions, attrition, and lack of growth of this cluster have all affected the size of this congregation. But none of that changes that we are still a cluster and we still exist here and the time has come for us to set about being Christ's hands and feet in the world through this church. That is what today is all about. All over the world, this reign of Christ Sunday, your hands and feet can come through for Christ in many ways. Your tithes and offerings, your ideas and prayers, your time and talents dedicated to making life a little better and more like the age to come. I invite you to think about how you can use your life to enrich the well-being of your families and this community of Gwinnett County. How you might use your love of Christ and your convictions to work for change in our state and nation. How you might use your resources to help those in need for the, in the larger world. As we approach Advent, a season of waiting, let us be active waiters. For God's greatest desire for us is that we make this age and the age to come look alike. 
one where Jesus Christ really does have all dominion and power, and we as the church reflect that to all we encounter. We are not so far into this decade of the 2020s. Let us make it be the end all of the me decades that began in the 1970s. We may be a small evolutionary cluster here, but don't forget Mead's words. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. While we may not be the largest or the strongest body, we are still called to be Christ's body. And so let us get to work and use our lives to enrich the lives of others. Let us use the model of divine empathy to give of ourselves in ways that so evidently spread God's love that none can deny a relationship with Jesus. For if we are spreading that divine love, all we encounter will be touched by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Jesus Christ will no longer be just our personal one, but a communal one, one that is big enough and welcoming for all. I ask you now, how will you begin? God holds the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains, the sea and the dry land. Let us offer our gifts to God, our maker. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept our offering in union with Christ's offering for us. Confirm in us the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, that we may testify to the sovereignty of his love. Through Christ, with the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On this Reign of Christ Sunday, may you feel the love of our Lord Jesus Christ through this sacrament. This is a table for all who know Christ and wish to partake. If you have not already gathered your elements, I invite you to pause here and grab a piece of bread or a cracker and some juice or even water will do. And join us and all the saints at this great feast. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You are a shepherd for your people, feeding them, protecting them from danger, binding up their wounds, searching for the lost, and bringing them safely home. Therefore, we praise you, joining the song of the universal church and the heavenly choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus is coming in glory to judge the world. Those who have cared for the needs of the least will be welcomed into his promised kingdom. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation, enlightening the eyes of our hearts, so that we may live in faith, hope, and love. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, and we offer up to you the prayer your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered the disciples into an upper room. And after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat of it, remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured. 
And he said, This is the cup of salvation, my blood poured out for you. Each time you drink of it, remember me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may take your bread or cracker. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And your juice or water is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Let us pray. God of us all, we thank you for always welcoming us to this table where we can commune with you and where we are in communion with one another. We thank you for this feast. We know that we are fed and empowered to go out into your world and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things in your son's holy name. Amen. As you go about this day, this week, this month, this year, think not about your personal relationship with God, but your place in the body of Christ. Remember that God knows you personally and loves you wholly so that you might spread that love far and wide, making the kingdom of God evident here and now. May God who seeks the lost keep you. May God who brings back the wandering heart uphold you. May God who binds up the injured heal you. May God who strengthens the weak empower you now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.